Turn with me to the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. The 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And here is where Jesus is telling a story. He tells three stories. He always used stories to illustrate spiritual truth. They're called parables. And everybody likes a good story. And Jesus was accused by the Pharisees and Sadducees and some of the religious leaders of fellowshipping and talking to sinners. And they didn't think you should. And so he told this story. He told about a, a son that wanted to get his inheritance and leave home. And it's well known around the world as the prodigal son. It's a picture of a young man, maybe out on a farm. He has a brother, an older brother. And he goes to his father, and it was the law of the land, and it was the law of the day, that he could ask for his inheritance. And being the youngest son, he inherited one-third of the estate. And his father was a wealthy man. And the father tried to talk him out of it. He said, Dad, I'm tired of being here on the farm. I'm tired of being under your authority. I'm going to go to the big city, and I'm going to live it up. So he decided that he would go to New York, or he would go to some great city. And uh, he took his money. And when he got there, he found some people that were very happy to be his friends because he had money to throw around and money to spend on them. And he took them to the best plays, and he took them to the best restaurants and the best nightclubs. And he had a marvelous time for a short time. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. Then it comes to an end. You can have a good time in sex, in getting drunk, I'm told. And I see it on television. They seem to be having a good time, but there comes an end to it. There's an emptiness to it. It leaves a void and you never get enough. And he was very much like young people in our modern generation. They don't want to be told what to do. And that's what young people are saying. Some young people are saying to their parents and teachers and the local police. Some of them are saying, have sex now. Don't wait for marriage. Buy now on credit. Pay later if you can. Assert your independence. Assert your dependence. Do your own thing regardless of the consequences. The Atlanta-based Center for Disease Control says that the number of American girls who are sexually active by the time they're out of high school has jumped from 28% in 1970 to 51% last year. It's currently estimated that one in 500 adults in the world are now infected with AIDS. And it's going to be an epidemic that some people feel could destroy the human race unless we find an answer to it and find it soon. This young man in Jesus' story sets out. He's going to live that kind of life. He wants all that he can get out of life, the good times. Out of sight of anyone who might know and criticize him, free to do as he pleases. There are over a million runaways in the United States every year. I realize many left home because of abuse and so forth. A recent article told of a boy who turned to life on the street when he was 12. And he said, I was a kid in trouble. I was in trouble with the law, with drugs, with alcohol, with my mom, with school. I was both drug addict and drug dealer. I was a criminal and a victim. I was an abuser and abused. And how many of our young people have gone to the streets and left home? Street life is a dangerous business, let me tell you. One out of every three runaways is lured into prostitution within 48 hours of leaving home. With the threat of AIDS, prostitution is a slow form of suicide. Almost all street drug users share needles. In their hunger for a fix, most ignore the precautions against AIDS. Street kids die quickly and quietly, we are told in our magazines. In America, more than 5,000 teenagers a year are buried in unmarked graves. Did you know that? 
5,000 teenagers a year are buried in unmarked graves. Teenagers are not, only the, are not the only runaways in our society. Hundreds of thousands of men and women run away from each other and their marriages through divorce. One person speaking of an affluent community in Southern California said, everyone here is running from something and this is the last stop. There isn't anywhere to go from here. I saw a book with a, little, with a title the other day in the bookshop, Help Lord, My Whole Life Hurts. And how many hurting people there are here tonight. This prodigal son is a picture of all of us because all of us in a way are running from something. Some of us have to depend on some sort of sedative just to get through the day or some sort of jolt, some aid to get through the day or through the night. We've aimed for our personal happiness and missed the mark of God's plan for our lives. Jesus said, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Many of you go to church. Most of you, I'd say, have been baptized or you have gone through confirmation. But deep inside, there's a void, there's an emptiness, and you are not certain that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. You are not sure that you're ready to meet God. You're not sure that you know Christ. You're running. All, us around, all around us here tonight, those of you that are listening outside, running away from something. This boy squandered his wealth and wild living. He spent it all and had nothing to show for it. In Isaiah, the 55th chapter, it says, why spend money for what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. When John F. Kennedy was on his way to that place in Dallas to give his last speech the day he was assassinated, he had in his speech this passage from Mark, the eighth chapter. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, you could have the whole world. It's not worth if you had it all, which you can't get. If you had it all, it's not worth as much as the soul that lives inside your body. You see, you have a body, but living inside is your soul or your spirit, that part of you that can have fellowship with Almighty God. And that's the part of you that's lost. And that's the part of you that needs renewal or dedication or redemption. And then this young man got to the city and had his wild fling. Then a depression came. It wasn't a recession, it was a depression. And let me tell you, I lived through the depression of the 30s and there's a great difference between a depression and a recession. What we're going through now would have been considered a great affluent depression compared to what the people of the 30s lived through in this country. And a depression could come again, we don't know. The picture of this young man's recognition of his condition. Jesus said he began to be in need. The first thing that happened was he lost his money. He couldn't get a job. He lost his friends. They were fair weather friends. And he didn't know what to do. Jesus says he began to be in need. He was hungry. And so he finally got a job feeding some hogs. And uh, you see him in that hog pen. Here he was, the son of a wealthy man. Out of his own lust and his own greed, he had wandered away from home. And now he has a job feeding pigs. But he, while there in that condition, he learned what the real life is all about. He was very humble. He became sorry. He said, I will arise and go to my father. My father has servants that have far more than I have. I'll go back to my father and I won't be his son anymore. I'll say, Father, when I get there, I'll become a servant if you'll only take me back. 
He said, I will arise and go to my father. Father, I have sinned against heaven. Notice he said against heaven. And in thy sight and am no more worthy to be thy son. Here you don't find any trace of arrogance. Not trying to justify what he'd done. He realized he had sinned and he cast himself on the mercy of his father. In King David's great confession of sin in Psalm the 51st chapter, 51st Psalm, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Because in this passage, Jesus is teaching us, God is the Father, he, lo he loves us, he longs for us to return, he longs for us to come back home, he wants to give you guidance in your life, he wants to give you a peace and joy and assurance that if you died, you'd go to heaven. But first, there must be a change. You must turn around. That's called repentance in the Bible. Repent, the scripture says. And so it says, in, and he arose and came to his father. He arose. He had to leave the pig pen. And that's why we give an invitation at all of our crusades. We give people an opportunity to take that step of repentance toward God. Many of you need to take that step tonight. Well, when you get back home, what kind of reception are you going to get? He didn't know. So he staggered in his dirty, filthy, smelly clothes back toward the home that he had left. And the scripture says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. God's not waiting to judge you. God's not waiting to condemn you. God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you, to shed his blood for you. He wants to put his arms around you and receive you back to himself. You've wandered away from him. And he will take you and forgive you and love you and be your friend. God is a God of love and mercy. Oh yes, there's coming a judgment. There'll be some day when you will stand before God at the great judgment day and you'll have to give an account of your life here and you'll have to give an account of what you did with Jesus Christ on this very night because there's going to be a judgment. But God's judgment is also tempered by his love and his mercy. He's willing to forgive you tonight. He's willing to give you a chance tonight. Today is the day of grace and salvation for all who will come, not because we deserve it, but because what Christ has done for us on the cross. By the cross and the resurrection, God has provided a way for you to have peace and joy and happiness in your heart. And as you're growing up, you need guidance you need direction, not to just wander about, but some destination, something to guide you. God will guide you. In Romans, the sixth chapter, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In 1 Peter, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now he didn't come like some young person would probably come back and say, hi dad, how are you? Did you miss me? Can I have my old room back? No, he didn't come with that attitude. He came in true repentance. True repentance doesn't presume on the grace and mercy of God. Can only come when the Holy Spirit convicts you and draws you to God. Beware of the attitude that says, I know that I'm on the wrong road, but I'm not tired of it yet. I'll repent and come back to God somewhere down the line. You may not be able to repent because the further you travel on the road away from God, the harder your heart gets. And the less you think you've done anything wrong and the less you think you need to repent, you must make that choice tonight. And the scripture teaches to come while you're young. 
Some of you think that you're too bad to come to God, have done too many things and gone too far. If you feel a tug in your heart to make your commitment tonight, you come because that's the work of the Holy Spirit working on you right now. I don't believe anybody is here tonight by accident. I think you're here because God saw to it that through a series of circumstances, you're here on this very night. The Holy Spirit is at work urging you to come. Don't harden your heart. The Bible says, he that hardened his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Now is the time to come. Now is the time to receive. Jesus told the story of this man, this young man, because the religious leaders had accused him of associating with bad people. Jesus told them there's great rejoicing in heaven over one person that repents. One person making his commitment tonight will cause rejoicing in heaven. You need to come home to God tonight. When that young man came, his father grabbed him in his arms, kissed him, ordered his servants to prepare a banquet for him, ordered that the finest robe in the house was put on him and a gold ring put on his fingers to signify that he had been received as his son again. He didn't take him back as a servant. He took him as a son. And that's what God will do tonight from you. Our, we just, our last crusade before this was in Glasgow, Scotland. And here's a letter from Scotland that I want you to hear. This is from a girl. I think she's about 19. No, 18. Before you came to Glasgow, I was an 18-year-old with a very big chip on my shoulder. I thought God owed me so much. I thought no one loved me. I thought there was no meaning to life. Something was missing in my life. I thought I was having a lot of fun. I was going out with the guys and getting drunk. I hated my family and felt so unloved. To be honest, I still feel unloved. Even by my family, they think I'm just a loser. One of my brothers used to sexually abuse me. The other one beat me up. I feel like I have it rough with very little love in my life before this week. I'm no angel. In fact, I'm a totally awful person. A few months ago, I was expelled from school and I was blaming drugs. My parents are still mad at me. My dad is a doctor and my mother is a teacher. They say it looks bad on them having a daughter like me. I don't fit in with my family. I heard you were coming to Glasgow and I said I would not go. But where I work, I was told I was assigned to do first aid every night at the crusade. And I was not happy. I went on Tuesday and I mocked you. I laughed at you. I said, what does he know anyway? I said, doesn't he know God does not care for us? But I guess I was listening anyway. On Wednesday, I said, I don't deserve God's love. I never cared if anyone saw me or what anyone thought. I felt loved for the first time. And on Thursday night, I came forward and received Christ as my Savior. I want to know this God who loved me more than anything. I feel loved as I write this letter. I have been received home. That could happen to you tonight. We receive hundreds of letters like that every week as young and old alike come to Christ. How many divorced people meet at a crusade like this? They come to the crusade, they receive Christ, and they decide to remarry. And that happens time after time after time. You say, well, Billy, what in the world do I have to do? First, repent of sin. That word repent means you change your way of living and tell God that you're sorry for what you've done and you come in humility. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. 
You say, Lord, I receive you tonight. I talked to a man today. He said, I, I go to church once in a while. He said, uh, I burn a few candles once in a while. And he said, I think that maybe indicates I'm a good man. I said, you have to go further than that. You have to receive Christ into your heart and your life and make him first in every decision you make. From now on, Christ is your leader and guide and savior. He died on the cross and shed his blood to forgive all of your sins. He rose again. He's alive. He's coming back again. And someday he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth. And we're all looking forward to that day. And you can be in that kingdom beginning tonight. You don't have to wait till he comes back. You can come tonight and be sure. And there are many of you here tonight that are just not certain of that. And you'd like to make sure. And you want to surrender your heart and your life to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat from all over the stadium and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, I receive Christ into my heart. You say, well, why do you ask people to come forward like this? Because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Did you know that? Everyone was public. There's something about making a public declaration that settles it and seals it. And you're saying to God and the whole universe, I take my stand for Christ. I receive him as my Savior and my Lord, and I'm going to follow him. And if you have been in the church but have wandered away from the church and wandered away from God, come back to him tonight. He stands with open arms ready to receive you with love and mercy and grace. You get up and come right now, hundreds of you, and say tonight, I want to follow Christ from watching by television. And you're not sure that Christ lives in your heart. You're not sure that he's your Lord and your master and the director of your life. You can make your commitment where you are. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559 or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Daniel. Now at this time, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was the greatest of all the kings, probably, that ever lived. And he conquered Jerusalem, and he takes some Jewish captives among the young men, many of them in their middle or late teens. They were scientifically inclined. He takes them back to Babylon to train them to help him as he builds his empire. Very much like the Soviets and the Americans after World War II, they took German scientists. I remember one of them was Werner von Braun, who made a great contribution to the American military power. And I remember sitting with uh, Werner von Braun not long before he died. We were at a banquet in Los Angeles at the Century Plaza Hotel. And my wife and I happened to be at the table with him, and we'd known him quite a long time. And he told us how, intellectually, he had come to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Not just by faith alone, but he became convinced that there was a God. And that drove him to study the Bible and the New Testament. And he came to know Christ as his Savior. Now, among the captives of Nebuchadnezzar, there were a number of top young Jewish men, 
Four of them are named in this passage, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they were disciplined in all the ways of the Babylonians so that they could help as Nebuchadnezzar extended his empire to become the greatest empire in the world at that time. Now Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew assertive discipline early. Because as we've already heard in the scripture that was read to us by John Wesley White, they refused to eat of the king's meat and drink of the king's wine because the king's meat had been offered to idols and they knew it was against the law of their God. Now they were 1,500 miles from home. Who would know? Who would care? But they knew God was watching. And as young men, they dedicated themselves and they committed themselves totally to God. Now Daniel had had a dream and uh, he called in the astrologers and the soothsayers and the scientists and all the other people and he said, tell me what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. And they said, well, tell us the dream. He said, I can't tell you the dream. I can't remember it, but it troubles me. Tell it to me. If you don't tell it to me, he said, I'm going to have you hacked to pieces. Well, boy, that really made them study and work and try to come up with the answer. But they said, we can't tell it to you unless you tell us the dream. We can't interpret it. And so Daniel called one of the guards over to him and he said, I can interpret the dream. God has revealed it to me. My God has. And he went to see Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, don't kill all the astrologers and the soothsayers and the wise men of Babylon. I'll tell you the dream and I'll interpret it. He said, what you dreamed was the dream of a great statue. And it had a gold head and its breast and its arms were made of silver and its thighs and stomach were made of brass. It had legs of iron and it had feet of clay mixed with iron or iron mixed with clay. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that's right, God has revealed it to you. Now, what is the interpretation? And so Daniel interpreted and said, you, sir, are the head of gold. You are the greatest empire, the greatest king that will ever live. And then it will decrease on down till the end of history. And then will come the stone cut out without hands and will crush the image and it will come tottering down. In other words, Daniel was being told by God, that all the empires of the world will someday fail and only the kingdom of God is going to survive. And that was that, but that's the second chapter. Now we come to the third chapter. There's another image. Nebuchadnezzar has become very powerful, very egotistical, as men of power often get. And so he decides he'll build a statue to himself, a big image, 99 feet high made of gold and he calls thousands of his subjects from many of the countries of the Middle East to come on the plain of Dura and there he says I want when you hear the trumpet sound and you hear the music play and you see the flags coming in and you see the marching of the soldiers I want all of you to bow down and worship the image and if you don't I'm going to throw you into flames of fire and you'll be burned up you see, force, false religion does not hesitate to use force. The Bible teaches that Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince and power of the air. He's the prince of this world. And he uses force to get people to believe strange things. And we're seeing force used by religious groups today all over the world as tensions are mounting on a scale so rapid that we cannot keep up with them. And we've seen even in the past few days things happening that we never dreamed would happen. But they are happening. And it seems that the world is rushing madly toward World War III and World War III will be Armageddon. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are already riding. I can hear their hoofbeats. And unless we repent and turn to God, they're going to come with all of their war and their destruction and the starvation and the diseases and the death and the hell that they bring with them. He commands that they worship the image. But Christ also was asked to worship at the image. He was asked to bow down and worship the devil in Matthew 4. But Jesus didn't argue. He didn't debate. He said, it is written. All he did was to use the word of God. 
That's the reason it's important to memorize passages in the Bible. Because he just used it as a weapon. And he said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. God had said in the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to choose. That's a choice that every person in this room will have to make. It's a choice that every person watching by television will have to make. It is a choice that every one of us has to make between bowing down to the things of this world that are evil and wrong and bowing down before the true and the living God. And the images that Satan calls upon young people to bow down to today, pride, lust, many other things. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego restrained their desires in situations of temptation. And they said, no, we will not bow down to the image. Now, Nebuchadnezzar could destroy the body, but not the soul. And Jesus warned about those who could destroy the body and the soul. In Matthew 10, he said, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a body, but living inside of you is your soul, your spirit. That's the part of you that will live forever. The part of you that remembers and the part of you that feels, the part of you that's the real you will live forever. And Jesus said, fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. That's the devil. Because hell was created not for you, but for the devil and his angels. And if you persist in bowing to the images of this world and rejecting the true and the living God in your life, then you are going to follow the devil to hell. Now, to disobey God's commands is called spiritual and eternal death. Now, these three Hebrews did not bow down. They stood up. They were the only ones of the thousands that were there from the different languages and the nations and the ethnic backgrounds of the whole world of that day that came to bow before the image of Nebuchadnezzar, they stood stiff like this as ramrods. They wouldn't bow. And of course, it was reported immediately to the emperor. Now, the alternates before them, they could have taken an alternate route. First, they could have bowed and avoid trouble. It would have compromised all that they believed in. They could have rationalized and said, it's our duty to obey the king. And that's our first duty. But they had a higher law. They had the Ten Commandments. They had God. And secondly, they could have said, it's just a matter of form. After all, religion is a matter of the heart. God knows that inwardly we're true to him, even though outwardly we'll bow down to the image. Or they could have stayed indoors that day. That would have been cowardly. They had an opportunity to witness to thousands that day. And they took an opportunity to do it. Jesus said, he that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. The Bible says, if sinners entice thee, consent not. Follow not the multitude to do evil. Then they could have said, we're far from home. God doesn't expect us to live like we did in Jerusalem. Who'll know? Who'll see us? Or they could have said that they were under obligation to the king, and they were. He'd been very good to them. Or they could have refused to bow which they did. They refused to bow. Choose you this day whom you will serve, says the scripture. Amen. Who are you going to serve? The true and the living God? Or are you going to serve these things that the devil brings in your path? The images that he places for you to bow to, for you to give in to. Decision could not be put off. They had to make a decision. Then, when the heralds announced it, when the announcement was made, they had to make a decision, just like some of you will have to make a decision tonight. You can't put it off. He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a point beyond which you can go, in which it is very difficult to return. And tonight, for many of you, this is the decision night. It's either yes or no. 
You say, well, it may be maybe. Some of you will try to straddle the fence and live in both worlds, but God doesn't allow that. Jesus will not compromise with you. He will not make it easier for you. He will not lower his standards. If he had lowered his standards, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. But he went to the cross and he died and he shed his blood for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He's coming back to rule this world someday. The gospel plan is all set. And God says you have to repent. You have to receive him by faith. You have to accept my son into your heart as Lord and Savior and let him rule your life if you're to enter my kingdom. Yes, they refuse to bow to the devil and give in to the devil. What if it does cost you a few pleasures in order to save your soul? Would it not be better to be thrown into the fiery furnace here than to have both body and soul cast into hell forever? And when your trial comes, and it will, if you're a true, born-again Christian, if you're following Christ, you're going to be tried and tempted and shaken as you've never been before. When it comes, act in the light of eternity. Do not judge the situation by the king's threat or by the heat of the burning fiery furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life which awaits you. Don't let the music of this world fascinate you. Don't let the drum beats cause you to march to the drum beats of this world. March to another drum beat that the world cannot hear, the drum beat from heaven. March by the steps ordered by the Holy Spirit and set by the example of Jesus Christ. And if you want to make that commitment, you that are watching television, you'll see a tele uh, telephone number there. Pick up your phone and call that number. Somebody is there waiting to talk to you, to help you, to make that commitment and that decision right now. Some of you are feeling the pressures. Some of you are going through trials and tribulations and temptations which are too great for you and you need help. You need prayer. There's someone there that will pray for you. And if you dial and it's busy, call back several times. They'll be there all evening. These brave young men dared the rage of the infuriated tyrant. And because they saw him who is invisible and had respect unto the recompense of the reward, they believed. But the king gave them another chance. Now, after this life is over, the Bible does not promise that you'll have another chance. No place in the Bible do I find where you're going to have a second chance. The moment you die, that's it. But the king gave them another chance. He gave them another opportunity. And they answered, tremendous answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, then he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. They didn't know that God would ever deliver them. They did not cringe and say, we beseech thee, please, Nebuchadnezzar, don't throw us in. Your majesty, don't. Think it over, sir. We can't disobey God, but we don't want to disobey you either. And they did not say, let's have a consultation and come to terms. And they went into this terrible furnace, and the men that threw them in were burned up. That's how hot it was. They said to God, thy will be done. And God says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. It was only after their decision, they made a decision, after they made their decision, it was then that God intervened and delivered. He says, lo, I'm with you always. And when you have troubles and difficulties, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then the king looked into the furnace, standing back as far as he could so he wouldn't be burned up. He looked in and he was astonished at what he saw. What did he see? He said, I see four men. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Three men had been thrown in. They should have been nothing but a crisp. They were bound. But he sees four men. And the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. God had either sent his angel there, or it was the Son of God himself that had come. God is with his people in the fiery furnace. 
He is with his people in times of temptation and trouble and trial. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, says the Scriptures. They have no hurt. The Lord shall preserve thee. He shall preserve thy soul. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? The way they walked into the fiery furnace, calm, self-possessed, joyful. Christ was with them. God was with them. Their bonds came off. And when the king ordered them taken out, they came walking out straight as a ramrod with their head high. Not even a hair of their head was singed. Their clothes, they'd gone in fully dressed. Their clothes didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And the king bowed down before them. And he said, your God is the true and the living God. And he ordered all the wise men and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans thrown into that furnace. And then he ordered that great crowd from all over the world to bow down to the true and the living God. And he destroyed the image that he'd built. And it changed Babylon because three young men dared stand alone, dared to die, dared to look death in the face and say, I believe. That's what Jesus Christ did. He stood before the cross. The cross was to be the next day. And that night on Gethsemane, he knelt down with his disciples and he prayed all night. And he sweat drops of blood. And he said, Lord, to his father, my father, not my will, but thine be done. If there's no other way to save the human race, if there's no other way to save Bill and Jim and Susie and Mary down yonder in 1983, I'll go to the cross. They deserve death. They've broken the law. They deserve judgment and they deserve hell. But if you want me to, and if it's your will, I'll go and take their hell and their judgment in their place. So he stepped out the next day. They put a crown of thorns on him. Here he was, the Son of God, with 72,000 angels with drawn swords ready to come and deliver him and sweep this whole planet out of existence. He said, no, I love them. And then he took that cross on his back and staggered after they'd beaten him and his back was bleeding and they'd pulled his beard and his face was bleeding and they led him up Golgotha's mount and there they put a spike in each hand and a spike through his feet and a spear in his side and he hung on the cross naked in front of a mass of people shouting, screaming at him and he stayed there for you and for me. He took it all alone on that cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. He took the furnace of hell for you so that you might be forgiven of your sins and when you die, go to heaven and have peace and joy here and now and have Christ with you through the Holy Spirit now every day. You don't have to live one minute alone. Every problem, every difficulty that you face, he's there. He helps you in deciding who you're going to marry or what your vocation is going to be or what your life is going to be or help you in your studies or help you in your relationships with other people. He's there to help lift your burdens here and now. That's besides the life to come. He gives both life here and now and life to come, and it's all yours if you put your faith and confidence in him. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, repent of your sins. How many of you here tonight could tell me what repentance is? You think you really know Christ, don't you? You go to church, you've been baptized, you've been to Sunday school, but you probably don't even know what repentance is. 
Repentance means change, the change of your mind, the change of your way of living. If when you came to Christ, your life didn't change dramatically over a period of time, then there's something wrong with that decision. If you have a doubt in your heart or mind that you're ready to meet God right now, you better settle it tonight and recommit your life to Christ and say, Lord, I need you. I was the leader of the young people in my church, but I really didn't know Christ in a personal way. And one night I found him. He found me and changed my life completely. And it was a totally different Billy Graham than the one that just went to church and led young people and told the elders of the church that I believed all the catechism and believed all those things. I did believe them with my head, but not my heart. My will had not been surrendered to the will of Christ. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. The word faith means commitment. We've heard that word tonight, commitment. That means you totally surrender for the rest of your life to Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, but as Lord. You surrender your personal life, your body, your mind, everything to him. And then thirdly, you're willing to obey him and follow him and serve him. Three things, repent, believe, and the word believe is where we stumble because we do believe with our minds, but I'm talking about believing with everything you have, surrendering it all to him, and then obeying him, whatever the cost. The world or the furnace, which will it be? Because there is a judgment to come. And if you'll make that decision tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. We've seen several hundred every night do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming symbolically, I do repent of sin. I do receive Christ as best I know how. I will follow him with his help. I'm going to ask you to come and stand here. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, and uh, we'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. It's a lifetime commitment to Jesus Christ. Quickly, you come. We're going to wait. Keep dialing. They'll answer after a while. May God bless you and help you as you make this commitment. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Time of decision is really the most important part of every crusade service. And it's the most important part of this telecast because right now where you are, you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ. Take time to make that telephone call or to write Billy Graham. The same helps we are giving these tonight who are responding here, we will send to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.